Well, welcome for uh, joining this session. Uh, my name is uh, Michael de Jong. I work as a director of solution architecture at Armacode. I will get to myself in a little bit more detail later on as I, uh, why I think I'm fit to talk to the audience about specific topics there. But as far as uh, introductions are concerned, my talk is about unifying your vulnerability management in the broadest sense of the word. So vulnerability management is all about finding things in whatever way you can imagine. So static analysis, dynamic analysis, infrastructure vulnerabilities, what have you, uh, but also asset management. Um, so that's what we as an organization focus on. I work for Armacode. And having said that, uh, as far as introductions go, how many people are familiar with the Purple Book community? Does it ring a bell? Not quite. OK, so let me start introducing the Purple Book community there. I'm using it as a let's say, source of observations that I'm going to elaborate on and I'm going to talk about in more depth. But to you, the Purple Book community should be a good uh, resource for information. It's an open source community by your peers in the industry. Uh, and that team has come together to start codifying best practices, observations, lessons learned. And it's a very dynamic uh, organization. So I would definitely recommend uh, you, vis you visit that site. And in fact, I will do it for you. It will also help me uh, get to my topic. Uh, so if you go to uh, Google and you actually check for the open, uh, 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 the Purple Book community, if you type Purple Book Security, uh, I guarantee you will not arrive at some funny page or inappropriate page. It will actually take you straight to this particular site. And as you can see, there is content available in the context of, uh, of the Purple Book. So it will describe what the book is about, and it will show you the table of, table of contents. Um, and on every topic, you can see that um, there are main authors and people that actually have validated the content and added to it as well with their LinkedIn profiles. Uh, I'm running this off my phone, by the way, so I hope uh, it didn't die. I mean, there we go. So why software security as a topic, for example? You can see the lead authors over there and also the co-authors. So nothing to do specifically with us as a company. We just facilitate that community. We contribute to it, but it's on its own. Um, a great source of, of data as, uh, as such. So why did I arrive at this page? There's also a resources section where we, every now and then, will post as an open source community the uh, state of application security. And uh, the one that I looked at as input for my talk is the one of 2022. And a lot of people actually have responded. And uh, they gave us insight into, A, where the practitioners actually come from. You can see it's fairly heavy North America focused at the moment, although we do have local pockets in EMEA and Asia Pacific as well. Uh, you can also see what their roles are. But they come up with interesting statements when you question them about the state of affairs. So many of the respondents, for example, to the questionnaire mentioned that they honestly have unmanaged risk in their portfolio. So what's the definition of unmanaged risk? It could be as easy as not having a full understanding of all the assets, all the things you care about. A, that you know about them, and B, you know about the security posture of those assets, which in my mind is, is interesting, right? Unmanaged risk. If something is unmanaged, if something is unknown, then by definition, it's a huge risk as far as I'm concerned. You cannot manage what you don't know about. So that's an interesting observation there. And there are others in there as well. So for example, whenever it comes to a deadline and the security posture of the thing you need to release is not quite where it should be, given certain internal standards or even worse, external standards, then the business almost always wins. The product will be pushed out into production at the risk of maybe incurring a a problem because of a vulnerability that hasn't been fixed yet. It's, it's lurking there, nobody has exploited it so far, but it could happen because we didn't do anything fundamentally to fix it. It will go out into the world and uh, because the company needs, well, basically meet uh, the bottom line, right? They need to make money, etc. So business wins typically over security. And there are other observations in there as well. Um, so I took data from this study and I took three items in there that I will elaborate on uh, in this particular talk. So let me go back to the, the story there. The Purple Book talks about many more uh, areas. Um, so in indeed, go there and, uh, and use it to your advantage. It's uh, free. It's open source. Uh, if you feel compelled to contribute, you're more than welcome to. 
So the topics that I want to talk about is why is shipping things fast more important and why does it happen uh, instead of making things secure and then start to ship things? Um, in my mind, it's not as much the fact that you meet a deadline and you push it over the deadline or you push it out because of the deadline and not being secure. The question is more, why wasn't it secure arriving at that particular deadline? I mean, that's ultimately the root cause, right? If it would have been secure at the moment you want to go live, then you wouldn't have this particular problem. So what makes that security is always compromised getting very close to that deadline? There must be fundamental reasons for that. I'm going into more details there uh, in a minute. The other thing is the unknown or unmanaged risk in the portfolio. This is another interesting thing, right? And, and honestly, I've, I've lived through these things myself as well. I used to work for a company, uh, the company still exists, so it doesn't sound like the company went belly up, but I used to work for a company that focused on segmentation at the network level. And it provided initially visibility of everything that was literally connected to the network. Every single customer that I went to using that technology, there was one thing that was consistent across all of them. We always saw more on the network than they knew about, which is interesting, right? And to give you a very concrete example, uh, we had everything locked down, but there was one unknown server still out there, uh, and it was heavily used. There was lots of traffic going in and out. So we literally had to follow a cable from uh, a switch, literally follow it, like follow the breadcrumb, so to say, and we arrived at a computer sitting underneath the desktop of a developer, and that was his local uh, GitHub repository. So they, they stored artifacts there. It was completely managed by them. A, the thing wasn't known about, it was a security risk, it was not take, uh, getting any patches because it was literally not known to the team that did the ops work that the machine existed to begin with. So they just organized it locally and there you go. The interesting, of, uh, the interesting thing, of course, is why did they do that? Well, their, reason, their reasoning was it takes us ages to get anything uh, procured and deployed and we are at this rapid pace getting to the deadline you can see how, how uh, uh, we arrived in that situation, right? Time pressure, uh, cumbersome internal processes, and so on. But this is just a example of unknown risk, stuff you literally don't know about. Or if you do know about stuff, do you know what the security posture is? Have you done any kind of measurement? Do you know what the baseline is, what it should be compliant with, if, if any? So that, again, is interesting, right? Um, lots, of, lots of unmanaged and unknown risk in the portfolio. And then more the human aspect. Uh, I'm an engineer myself. I spend lots of time uh, developing hardware and software in the field of nuclear medicine, nuclear industry. Um, as you can probably guess, that industry is not very keen on having flaws in product. I mean, literally mushroom clouds, people dying, etc. cetera. Um, it also <laughs> caused many sleepless nights because you were always thinking, okay, if this lung ventilation system is going out into the hospital and you have this infant that's hooked up to your machine that you designed and we are helping it breathe but we are also pumping in slightly radioactive gas to see if the lungs are correctly developed that really makes you think about how you specify your requirements and how you do your testing so it helped shape my mind on i want to prevent some stuff from happening always even at the risk of providing less functionality but i will never ever want to be known as the guy that caused serious harm to let's say an infant so th that mindset is a different one, right? Because developers are very much focused on delivering functionality for which customers pay. Do customers pay for security? It's usually a assumed quality of, of the software, right? You buy it, you're a professional organization, you've done whatever you need to do, you implemented the best practices. How do people specify security, right? It's kind of like an overarching or an, a, a property woven into everything you do. So, just to indicate that my background may that I was very aware of certain things that are not specified. Let's say the, the abuse cases or the misuse cases rather than just the use cases. But going back to the story, development teams and security teams, they are, well, mildly friendly, <laughs> to put it in a, in a particular way. Um, I actually think uh, they like developing. They like to deliver new stuff, going back and fixing things, let alone documenting things. Not so much. It keeps you from doing the fun bit, right? It's much more fun using a new technology, a new tool, build something new, or maybe partially reinventing the wheel, 
figure out yet another way to persist things in a database or what have you, or jump on the latest bandwagon of cloud-based or containerized or microservices, what have you. It's kind of like this never-ending churn, right? And it's good to keep them engaged. Sometimes it's beneficial for the business, et cetera, et cetera. But it makes it a little bit awkward if you put it in the context of security. The security team doesn't, they are more traditional, right? They like to keep the things the way they are. No new technologies. It means new unknown risk, right? You don't want to be the first one using a new technology because you will find all the issues associated with that new technology. So that makes it a little bit of an animosity between the two teams. Um, development thinks security is keeping them from doing fun stuff um, and vice versa. Security says we really need their help, but they are not really willing to do so. What can you do to actually make that predicament better? All right, so we did it with the open source community around the Purple Book. They came up with this knowledge. But just to do some name dropping there, um, we've, as a company, have been working with companies. A couple of the names are mentioned here. What is the common thing on this slide? You can't really read it. You have to infer it. It's, they, they all run software as, a, as core of their business. I mean, take an art name like Walt Disney Company. I'm thinking, you know, movies and stuff. It's actually a hardcore digital company, right? The whole company runs on IT and lots of it. They have thousands of developers in-house. So Disney, the, the traditional uh, cartoon and movie company, it's actually uh, uh, a proper IT company. Um, Johnson Controls, embedded systems, thermostats and what have you. Embedded systems, again, um, a hardcore software company. That's actually true for all of them. If you look at the logos and you position them in that particular domain, it's across the board, right? It's, it's prevalent in the entire industry. There is no particular space where this problem is more or less prevalent. Of course, some of these companies operate in a domain where compliance or compliancy is an issue, right? Uh, PCI, for example, if you accept credit card payments. Uh, GDPR is true for everybody that stores privacy details. Uh, of course, in the finance industry, you have things like, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, SWIFT, or uh, I already mentioned PCI. It's a heavily regulated industry, and they actually see compliance obligations imposed uh, on them. So, and they have to demonstrate and meet that uh, compliance obligation. I already talked a little bit, speaking of name dropping, uh, about myself there. Uh, maybe you were expecting Jason Stott to show up here on stage today. It was advertised in the, in the brochure. I'm definitely not Jason Stott. He is our CRO. But um, yeah, he was unfortunately not able to make it uh, uh, to this session. He would have loved to, but uh, was uh, unable to do so. So you have to bear with me. I'm the uh, director of solution architecture. I can at least talk about the technology bit. If you have any questions regarding anything other than that, then I have a, uh, a colleague, Jürgen Terlings, over there, who's more than happy to talk about the company and uh, what we do with customers. So having said that, let's uh, dig a little bit deeper into some of the problem areas. I already mentioned that um, in order to assess the security posture of an asset, whether it's software or hardware, or let's say a cloud-based asset, asset in the broadest sense of the word, you need to have some sort of measuring tool, right? So just a question for the audience. How many people in the audience or the organizations that you work for are making use of tools with the, the funny acronyms like DUST and SUST and SBOM and SCA and you name them, right? Pen testing, dynamic analysis, static analysis, if you want to make it a little bit more abstract. How many of you actually employ those technologies, let's say, within the organization, within the development lifecycle? Can we have a show of hands? Yeah, so a decent percentage, right? How many of you actually use more than one of those technologies? Yeah, so my point is, for good reasons, there's always a collection of tools, technologies to find stuff in an organization. I, for one, have worked for a company called Fortify Software. Uh, they produce compiler-like technology. You put source code into the thing, and out came a list of interesting possible problems from a security perspective. So with some degree of certainty, but there was always a, a noise-to-signal ratio that was sometimes good in certain areas, sometimes not so good, right? False positives, as we call them in the industry. You have another type of tool called a dynamic analysis tool. I think of it as throwing stones at something, right? You have a big stone, you throw it at a window, the window breaks, you have a problem. Maybe the window wasn't thick enough. In other words, you try to simulate what a bad guy would do and then see what the reaction of the thing you pointed at actually is. So at least those two types of technologies you probably want to use uh, in conjunction, right? Fundamental 
problem, exploitable problems by a tool. I can tell you, if a tool can exploit it, rest assured, the bad guys will exploit it even better, right? They will definitely find those. So that's the low-hanging fruit. Now, a traditional company goes from on-prem to cloud. Another set of tools shows up, right? Static uh, sorry, um, software composition analysis, or maybe infrastructure as code. Those are config files, right? You specify how things should be set up and deployed. You can make problems there from a security perspective. So if every new technology you adopt in your organization, in comes another set of tools, right? Before you know it, you have a whole bunch of those technologies. And then something interesting starts to happen. Put yourself in the perspective of a security-focused person. How do you get to your data that you need to make any kind of decision, right? How do you get your visibility? So it's very difficult for companies to get that visibility, let alone that you can then leverage that, let's say, single pane of glass or that consolidated view to do interesting analyses, for example. Let me give you one example uh, to, to show an example of an actionable insight. If my static analysis tool, and I'm intimately familiar with what they do, uh, finds, uh, let's put a, a weird number out there, a thousand issues of a certain type, and then your dynamic analysis tool finds also a certain bunch of issues, and then somehow you can tie the two together. So they need to have something in common, like a common weakness enumeration. So an identifier that says, we are talking about the same type of thing. So external perspective, dynamic analysis, internal perspective, static analysis. And I have 10 issues that have the two corroborate the issue. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to have? Because it kind of helps you prioritize things, right? You have a potential problem in the code. It looks like something was not implemented correctly. And we have demonstrable proof that we could actually exploit it. If you can link the two, it makes it a more interesting item. In the context of, I only have so much time, usually it's limited time, um, to actually start fixing things, right? You want to fix the stuff that will most likely get you killed, that have a high likelihood of being exploited. Or maybe you tie in your, your dynamic analysis findings and you combine it with a threat intel source that says, hey, for this CVE that you found with tool XYZ, whatever it is, we actually have evidence that is being currently exploited in the wild. Again, that's your low-hanging fruit. You may want to bump up the priority of those to start working on and make it a work package towards your developer. And remembering my uh, remark regarding security and development not uh, liking each other all that much, if you present a list of findings from technology and you can corroborate that with actual exploits out in the wild, or you say those two tools found the same problem, then you kind of build your case for, dude, or do this. You have to work on this, right? Because I'm pretty sure I'm not wasting your time. This will actually get us killed in this context. So you probably want to start working on that. So having multiple tools is not a problem, right? The problem is how to get all that data together and do something actionable with it. Because finding stuff for the sake of finding, in my mind at least, makes no sense, right? You, you can look at it in this tool, and then what? You need to take it to the next step. Um, so maybe you should put an uh, abstraction layer on top of it, right? Gather all that data into something that hovers above it that will provide different perspectives to different people and make it actionable. From an architecture perspective, that's my job, you can also say, well, I'm now using tool XYZ, but I'm not quite happy about it. Or I've been using it for three years now. Let's just swap it out for a similar tool from a different vendor. It gives you some leverage, commercially speaking, with contract renewal and stuff. So that's one thing. But again, that's commercial, so let's not talk about that. But the other thing is, if you have exhausted the capability of tool XYZ, you may swap to a competitor of that technology and say, now you go at it for three years, you get a better spread, right? Maybe they are better at finding some other cat category of issues. But rather than pulling the engine out and then training everybody on that new product, if you have an abstraction layer on top of that, you can just plug in different components, different tools as you see fit. But the view you have above that abstraction layer remains the same. So it doesn't have an impact to your organization, the way that you work, and so on. So literally, it abstracts you away from the things that find stuff versus how you then manage the stuff that's found and how you work with it within your organization. All right, so meaningful automation. It's a very easy business case to make, right? If you do something repeatedly and it's a mediocre talk, automate it, right? Uh, and that's usually lacking. It also means that people don't want to do it, right? If you have to do it again and again, and it's not adding much value from your perspective, 
try to automate uh, the heck out of it and make sure that people adopt it because it's literally not in their way. It takes the pain out of change, right? Change management is difficult enough already. If there's any kind of obstacle, as in more work for the team to be done, if you can automate it, you can, re you, you can lower that barrier, right? So that would be a good thing to have as well. Um, communication, as I mentioned, between the two teams, they live in different bubbles, right? First of all, and let me go to the next one as well, the ratio between security team versus development team, the practitioners, practitioners that build stuff, is off. It's not like one-to-one. -one. It doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, but li almost always the security team is understaffed. They have a lot of things to do, right? They cannot get very close to the team, even if the team really needs it. If you have a team that has shifted left quite a bit, they are more mature, they have a security lead within the team, they can do more on their own. If not, then the security team needs to be closer to the team, but they live in a different bubble. Again, to give you a really simple example, if I live in this abstract world and I give comments and statements, my developers that I'm working with, they live in their tool landscape, right? They use Jira or GitHub issues or Azure board, or even worse, they have all three of them because we have different technology stacks operationally in our organization. Now it becomes difficult, right? Where do I put my issue? I, I don't know anything about Azure board or GitHub issues or Jira uh, as an example. How can you straighten that out? How can you make that interaction more smooth? Very simple thing, but it helps with being able to communicate more freely and easily uh, within an organization. And as I mentioned, you need to enable your security team, right? Make them focus on where they can make the difference rather than going to different interfaces, having issues with communication, and so on. So hopefully I gave you some better understanding as to why these problem areas are really problem areas, what some aspects are. Um, if you actually pull it up to the use case level, you, you should always start with visibility, right? You can never have enough visibility. You want to understand as, a, let's say, a, a manager or a C-level person, what is going on. And whether it's good or bad is beside the point, right? You want to know what's going to hit you. Uh, because only then, if you know about it, you can start to act. You also want to present it in different perspectives. As a CTO, I would like to understand the training needs for my teams. As a security guy, I'm more interested in the most prevalent issues and see if a security training actually pays off or maybe um, which team is the weakest from a security perspective so I can spend my time there. As a business owner or a compliance officer, I want to demonstrate that our, what we say we do, we actually do, right? The tools are running, they produce the issues, the SLAs are met, we have this closed feedback loop, uh, there is a burn down of issues, I want to demonstrate to an external auditor that we do what we say we do, and I can not talk about it, I can literally show him live what is going on there. You can never have enough visibility. Also the asset discovery piece, right? What are my assets? What is the criticality of that and so on? Prioritization, I gave you an example already of dust and sust, and sometimes it's as simple as that, right? You can think about AI maybe benefiting this space. I think that's a tough problem to solve because without any commonality, sometimes between the various scanning tools, it's very difficult to start correlating things, right? We cannot dream up that they are related, right? There needs to be some hard sort of detectable evidence in order to be able to do so. But putting things in a risk context, onboarding an asset and classifying it, like does it deal with privacy data? Is it deployed in the cloud versus on-prem? Is it internet facing or not? Simple questions, but it will kind of steer you in the left or in the right direction. Put it in perspective, put it in context. Threat intel, easy to tap into, use it to your advantage. Efficient remediation, if you give a developer a highly accurate um, work package, with demonstrable issues that he really needs to fix. If you can augment that, so add to it knowledge on how to do things properly, he learns on the job, but you also enable him to do the right thing. So we give you high quality findings. They must be fixed for this and that reason, uh, given the, the SLA and the context of the application. And by the way, this is what the industry best practice is to deal with cross-site scripting issues. And validate your input against what you know rather than leaving it open-ended as an example. The developer cannot push back, right? I mean, he gets, uh, if he has to do something, he rather has that kind of a work package than take the top 100 issues of this tool that we found 1,000 issues with. Automation, 
clear use case for that. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as new findings come in, they offer a critical application, send out a Slack, which is hip and happening, or a Teams, or a good fashioned old email to the person that owns that uh, product so he knows about it and then he can follow up and, and, and check as we go along. And then finally, when all of this is in place, all the first, let's say, four use cases, this is this is going on and on and on, then you can glean very interesting insights from what is happening there. And you can literally see the key process indicators that you need to, well, show that you're on the right track, but also to, to demonstrate that the investment made in people, in process and technology, I mean, yeah, it's what it is for this industry, in those aspects, that you get the return that you expect there. And you can set standards and baselines and you can actually demonstrate and see if you're tracking in the right direction or even meet those uh, requirements. So some of the valuable outcomes that I see with my customer in no particular order, I'm not going through all of them one by one, but uh, as I mentioned, you can never have enough visibility, right? Uh, regardless, people always say, now that, that you helped us hook into our ecosystem, we get this consolidated perspective, that already is good enough for me, right? It, it can only get better from there, but that's what I need, right? Now I know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally turned the light on in my organization. I don't always like what I see, but at least I now see it, right? Rather than waiting for it to happen and not even be aware. So um, the asset finding, um, like I said, every single customer always has more than they actually know about. So being able to help them detect more of what they have and, and expose that uh, is seen as very uh, helpful. The interaction with teams, almost by definition, if you get the communication flow and the prioritization of the issues right, it goes a long way to helping you with the change management aspect of things. Um, let me see. The interesting thing is, if you can leave developers in their bubble, you don't need to change anything there. It has very subtle benefits, right? A, no change for them. No change means no change management. Not learning yet another tool, not yet another interface. They probably chose the technology stack and they had control over that for a good reason. So you shouldn't take that away from them, right? You gave them something and now you take it away in favor of some other technology. You shouldn't need to do that, right? Leave them in their bubble. They are happy there and the bubble is perfectly fine for them to do what they are supposed to do. But make sure that you can still, without any friction, can communicate from the one to the other bubble. If you do so, you can also foster, of course, um, security knowledge within the teams, and maybe you can even grow security leads within the teams, help them shift left, or at the very least, raise the maturity level within the uh, organizations that actually do the work. And then finally, uh, just a word for uh, the sponsor of this event, in part, and for my sponsor, since I work for Armacode, if you might think what it is that Armacode does is we are the spider in that web, this abstraction layer that I talked about, if you really instantiate that, you end up with a platform like ours, it will just literally hook itself as a spider in the web. It gets all the data from the land, so to say, what's already out there, and it will provide you the use cases that I was talking about conceptually uh, to more or less uh, extent. And having said that, that's end of story for today. If you feel like uh, asking me questions on something in the context of this presentation, feel free to do so, either here or we are also out there, uh, or I will stay lingering here for a, a couple of more minutes. Having said that, thank you for your attention, and um, hopefully that made sense. <laughs>